Hello and welcome. Today we're talking about French horns. Stick around. Hi, my name is Katie Rios. I'm Jason Buckingham. We're here at Alamo Music Center. Please remember to like and subscribe. And uh, if you're in town, come and visit us at the store at 425 North Main on the surface of the sun. <laughs> Um, today we're talking about French horns and we have a guest, Katie. Katie is our brass tech downstairs in Repair World, but she's also a French horn player. So instead of having me talk poorly about <laughs> French horns, we figured let's have an expert. So French horns, um, we'll just start real basic. Um, there's a single French horn and a double French horn. Why would somebody want a single French horn, for example? So there are really only two advantages to starting off on a single horn, and that's typically for only the most basic of beginners, maybe one to two years when they're starting off. So a single horn is cheaper, so that's always a selling point for people if they're not sure if their kid is going to stick with the instrument. Sure. So they can get something that's good quality, but is about two or three thousand dollars cheaper than a standard double French horn. So that's one advantage, but then also the single horn is generally a lot easier to start on. It's more responsive. It's a very limited range, but what's needed when somebody is a beginner is ease of playing. And basically they're just gonna live in the staff. They're not gonna be way underneath or way above the staff. It's yeah, gonna be right. right in the middle. That's right, that's if uh, they're a particularly gifted player, they might venture outside that, but typically, the first year, they're just trying to get the hang of the basics. Is it more typical than not for students to start on a single horn, or is there any advantage to starting on a double horn? It really depends on the band program and if they have rentals available or different things like that, if the students are going to have to actually provide their own instrument. I personally think that starting on a double is just fine. It can be more difficult at the beginning, but I think the students can quickly progress to more advanced material. But if the, if the school or the rental programs locally have single horns, that might be an easier thing to just start on because you don't have to actually buy it and invest. So when we're talking about double horns, Basically, the way I understand it is a, a double French horn is kind of like two horns smashed into each other. There's the F side, which is that the more common side you play on? Yes. And then the B flat side. Mm -hmm. um, is that a range thing? Is it an intonation thing or kind of all the above? It's all of the above. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. So when French horns first started, natural horns had no crooks on them. They had no tuning slides. It was just a big circle of metal. And you're actually using what's called the harmonic series. It's the naturally occurring notes. If you play on a straw from McDonald's, you can get a certain number of notes on it, right? right? right. Um, so when you add slides to it, you can get more notes because you change the length of the tubing. So you have some tubing that's 20 feet long, and then you press a button and it becomes 22 feet, 25 feet. So it changes the key, but it also gives you more options of notes you can play and improves the tuning significantly for a lot of notes. How would you decide how to go back and forth? Is that something that's specific to a model or just through trial and error, or is there a standard way to approach that? Well. Typically, teachers will teach you a set way, and that is kind of best practice. And then, at a certain point, when you get past high school, maybe into college or professional level, you'll have horns that are maybe a little bit more nuanced and temperamental, and you can decide what, um, what fingerings to use and what side of the horn to use based on your preference and the tuning. And that's just something a player would figure out. Mm -hmm. on their own. At the beginning, the teacher will guide you and give you sort of the standard approach. Okay. So anything that is below a G under the treble clef, 
and above a G in the treble clef, those you typically are gonna start using the trigger finger, which is the B flat side of the horn. That's best practice. Some people, they can get away with using the F side, but the tuning is just, it's different depending on the horn. Okay. Um, I know the range of the instrument at when it's at its peak, what is it, six octaves? Five uh, octaves? I think it's five to six octaves. Five to six yeah, octaves. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Because I'm a euphonium player and I have roughly five usable octaves. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, if you're a complete horn nut, which I am not, you can even go so far as to buy a triple or a descant horn, which that extends your range even more. So people are screaming up there in trumpet register and you can extend it to six or seven octaves. A triple horn. Yes. I wouldn't even wow. get into that territory. That's very specialized stuff. Got it. Well, today we have a Con 8D. Um, they seem to be, at least in, in our sales history, probably the more, most popular French horn out there. Um, is there any particular reason why people tend to gravitate towards these? I think there are two main reasons, but one is tradition. The Berve brothers were three very famous French horn players that helped to develop the horn in 1938 with Con. Oh, wow. And they really put a lot of effort into making something amazing. So it's been consistently a good horn since the 40s and 50s. So it's got a good track record, and I would argue that it's kept that consistency the whole time. For the 8D in particular. Okay. But also, I think it's it's tradition. There are a lot of people that grew up playing with them. They're familiar with the sound, and they're familiar with the nuances of this particular model. So as teachers, they tend to pass their preferences on to their students. It's something we talk a lot about with, with different models, is the predictability and the stability right. from horn to horn. Right. And I'm assuming you know, that's the case with this instrument. Yeah, I actually grew up playing on a lot of cons and particularly con 8Ds. And I can pick up a con that's old. I used to have one that was made in the 50s. I can pick up a con that's new and it feels fairly similar. So I kind of lump French horns in a big family of instruments that when I talk to parents, I call them scholarship horns, mm -hmm. French horn, bassoon, yes. tuba to a certain degree, where if you get really good at that instrument, you can basically pay for college. Yes, well, that's exactly what I did. Really? I went to Allstate when I was in high school in Texas, and the top chair that I made was 12th in the state. And then I went on to audition for several colleges and I went to the University of Texas for free. I mean, everything was paid. Tuition was paid thanks to some military scholarships that my dad had. Okay. And all of my school expenses were paid by scholarships that I got through the music school. So w when I would talk to parents about when it's time to invest, and I don't, I don't think anybody would suggest to buy it buy an 8D right out of the gate <laughs> right. for their sixth grader, right? Right. But let's say they're going into high school and they're getting ready to plunk down, you know, I memory serves, I don't want to misquote it, but, you know, you're looking at a over $4,000 investment. Absolutely. But you get that back potentially with, even with partial scholarships, mm -hmm. you can pay for that horn pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um so you actually did do the full ride thing. I did. How many, just out of curiosity, how many, you went to UT. Yes. How many people were in that studio? I would say about 20 or 30. Out of that 20 and 30, how many were scholarship students? Oh, I would say at least 10. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. Yeah, absolutely. French horn, if you're good at it, you can pay for your school. Same thing with bassoon, same thing with... Tuba, trumpet, not so much because there's a million of them. Right. And it's way more competitive. Not that French horn isn't competitive, but 
there's less of y'all. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Well, you hit the nail on the head with that comment about if the horn player is becoming more advanced, maybe mid-high school, they're thinking about continuing with horn. It's a really big investment for parents to buy a horn, which I love that school programs in Texas and even places like Alamo have really good rental programs mm -hmm. because that kind of takes the sting out of wanting to buy something. You can try something that's really good, like an 8D, see if your kid likes it, see if it's something that you would be wanting to invest in, and always consult your teacher before you buy something. Don't just buy something. Yeah. That's a big no-no. But if you want to try before you buy, Generally in Texas, that's going to be very doable. I think a lot of school programs generally, at least in, in, in junior high, I would say probably 85% of them have horns that they can rent. Yes. Because just like with bassoon or tuba, the cost is just so astronomical that Yes. Oh, you're joining band here, spend $6,000 on a tuba. I'm Absolutely. done. <laughs> the cost can be extremely prohibitive, especially with larger instruments. Right. You, you were talking about tuba and bassoon, and French horn actually, oddly enough, is a very big instrument. Right. I believe it's about 45 feet of tubing if you stretched it all out. So it's a lot of tubing. Wow. But instruments that use more material are just, by nature, more expensive. So talking to your band director, talking to your teachers, talking to local music stores and saying, hey, do you have a rental option? More than likely they'll be able to help you or point you in the right direction. Yeah, that, that's vital advice. Because I mean, we were talking earlier, I've had, I had a student who went out and bought a French horn that was just not a quality instrument, right? Ugh, it hurts my heart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, you got a deal on it, but if you have something that that you can't really play or get fixed, because that, that's the other thing I think right. people step into is they, they buy something that's, that's inexpensive and, well, you can't fix it because there's no parts. Absolutely. It's kind of like buying a car. You want to make sure that whatever brand you're getting, you can actually get the parts for it as well. Because even if you get a really good deal, if your instrument breaks, if it's damaged, if they can't get the parts for you, which sometimes it's not that they're being lazy and they don't want to order them, it's nobody makes them anymore. The right. factory went out of business, then you might end up in a really awkward situation where you have to sell your horn and buy a different one. Which, you know, you can pay me now or pay me later. <laughs> exactly. Right? It's exactly. That, that and you get what you pay for. Um, in terms of, of care for the instrument, is there anything unique to French horns as opposed to a trumpet, let's say, that, that a student new to the French horn needs to be aware of? I mean, just as far as basic maintenance, you need to make sure you're greasing and oiling very regularly, especially greasing all of the slides because we have about nine or ten that need regular greasing. And the, what a lot of people don't understand is that when you oil it regularly, the oil will actually cut the grease and wear it down faster. Mm. So if you're not greasing regularly, then your slides are more likely to get stuck. But also, French horns are a little bit different than something like trumpet or euphonium or even a lot of tubas in that they have rotary valves. Mm -hmm. So. It's a subtlety. You can use normal valve oil for piston valves on your French horn, but they actually sell oil that's specially made for rotary valves, which I prefer for my students. Why don't they, they put piston valves on a French horn? Is it just not physically doable? Well, there are some early models of French horns that they have a piston thumb valve. Okay. But I think part of it, I'm not an expert, but I think part of it is that the rotary valves are just easier with the amount of tubing that you have to access. Because that in, makes sense. Because instead of having to stack the valves a certain way, you've layered them so the rotary valve opens and closes 
and either the bottom or the top tube is open or closed. Okay. Whereas with piston valves, you push down and it opens all of the tubing. Right. So it's a little bit of a different design. Um, one thing I notice on there too that's different from any other brass instrument, there's no spit valve. Well, sometimes you have a spit valve that it will be installed right at the bottom okay. of the lead pipe because you're holding it up at an angle like this. So gravity is gonna pull it down here. Okay. So that's something that occasionally you'll see, but you're right, generally it's not gonna be there. And that's why you need to keep all the, all the tubes lubricated because you pull them a lot. Yes, you do. You're gonna be pulling the tubes out to empty the water multiple times during a playing or practicing session. That's one thing I would always kind of crack up watching French horn players dismantle yeah, their horn. After, yeah, you're doing this after scramble. like every third rep of something, they're like <laughs> going crazy taking their horns apart. And I'm just like, yes. <laughs> I tell my students always empty your horn before you're about to play <laughs> because the worst thing that ever happens, this has happened to me before, I'm not perfect. You go to play your solo, and first note, <laughs> go a little, a little you, yes, you start getting the gargle. <laughs> it is the worst feeling. I've had that happen. But a you times. you do that once, and then you're scarred, and you remember for for the future. You know? <laughs> right. Well, let's hear a little bit of it. Okay. <laughs> So are there any more uh, little fun facts we should know about the French horn? Oh, I always have fun facts. I think they're fun. I don't know if other people will think they're fun. <laughs> but uh, some interesting things that are pretty, um, I wouldn't say unique, but definitely special about the con. So like I said, it was developed in 1938. It's been around a long time, and that's almost 100 years. Yeah. So that's a pretty great track record for it to still be manufactured in almost the same way. So that's pretty neat. It also is made of nickel silver. Everything is made of nickel silver, which is, that was kind of odd, I think, for the time. But nickel silver is a special type of brass that has nickel in it. It is very resistant to rust and to corrosion. And so that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. It's going to last a really long time, which is pretty awesome. When they did that, was that out of, because 1938, that's getting close to World War II. Was, mm -hmm. it, was it a practical matter or was it an, an actual artistic choice? Like we need this alloy. I think it was a little bit of both. Bit of Nickel both. silver has a really special sound. I think I've sp said special about four times, but I do think it's special. Yellow brass has a very bright sound, and okay. gold brass, which has a higher copper content, it has a bit of a warmer sound. 
And the nickel silver has a very, very dark sound. I always call it the, the dark chocolate sound. Okay. It's this really nice kind of warm, deep sound, a really nice tone, as opposed to things like yellow brass or silver, which are very, very high and piercing like a trumpet. I don't see a lot of those metals moving. Most of the stuff we sell, it seems like people are ordering the nickel mm -hmm. version. And part of that, I think, is just because it does last so long, and the sound is a sound that is consistent and people are used to hearing. So the tone quality, especially if you have a lot of brass instruments that are made of the same material, the tone quality across the ensemble is going to be similar. Well, and I know speaking as a former band director and whatnot, you want matched horns and trumpets and everything as much as you can for that predictability factor with with instant intonation. Right. It's and enough of a you know pig chase just to get something in tune. But absolutely, if everybody's on the same or similar equipment, right, it makes it a little easier. Right, and uh, I think we talked about that before, just you and I at some point, that getting horns that are the same in your section, the same brand, it is easier to tune mm -hmm. because all of the horns have tendencies. 8Ds tend to play slightly sharp, and so a lot of times you'll see people pull their tuning slides out a little bit okay. and leave them out because it tends to be sharp, so that helps it to flatten a bit. Whereas if you have people with different models, it can be more difficult for middle schoolers and high schoolers to tune consistently. Are there any, like on a trumpet, really any brass instrument, it starts getting squirrely around, let's say the fourth partial, mm -hmm. same-ish kind of pitch tendencies with French horn? Yeah, as you get up into the higher part of the treble clef, up into the staff, tuning generally becomes more difficult. In general, when you're working with the harmonic series on any brass instrument, the more you go up, the pitches actually become closer and closer together. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot easier to get them wrong and to crack yep. and to get the tuning off. Yep. I think we've talked about the harmonic series a couple of times on here. So regular viewers, and definitely former students of mine know all about the Overtone series. Yes. Well, and the con also, this has sort of fallen out of vogue now, but I'm a really big fan. It was also made with a specific wrap, which is how the tubing is curled up and put in here. So it has what's called a Kruspa wrap. In German, it's Kruspa, but I'm not German. And sometimes you'll have a Geier wrap horn, which has a different sound. It's a brighter sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that it looks, Kruspa wrap horns have the trigger valve up here, the fourth valve, and Geier wraps have it down here. So you end up with a, a very long, <laughs> instead of this short arm right here, you end up with a giant arm that goes all the way down to the bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I never knew what that was called. But. Yeah, but that rap style actually affects the way the horn plays. And again, I think the Kruspa rap has a darker, richer sound. And the Geyer, which is more in vogue now, has a very bright sort of piercing trumpet that's sound. A, that's a more modern design, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the Kruspa was sort of the I would say the classic. Got it. But uh, I don't know. Don't come after me, horn enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank our special guest, Katie, today for talking to us about French horns generally and the 8D specifically. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe to our channel. The more the merrier. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.